So now we move back to Adam alayhi salam. Before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually mentions to us the conversation that took place between him and the angels, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, huwa الَّذِي خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that created for you everything in this earth. He created it for you. ثُمَّ اسْتَوَىٰ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ فَسَوَّاهُنَّ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rose above the heavens and He made them seven skies. وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full knowledge of all things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us before He even mentions the conversation where He tells the angels that He's going to place us upon this earth that everything was already placed here at our service. Now the conversation that I'm about to mention, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there's a narration from him that says that it's 2,000 years after the war between the angels and the jinn. Uh, when the jinn were, were, uh, were fought on this earth and they were pushed uh, to the oceans, to the seas, and the angels rose and they rose with, they came uh, with Iblis, they brought Iblis amongst them. And it seems like, you know, the earth's purpose has already been dealt with, meaning the jinn have already been destroyed because of what they've done. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels, إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً that I'm going to place a caretaker, a successor, there are many translations and I'll describe it, um, on this earth. Now the angels, when they heard that, they responded, أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاء They said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, are you going to place upon it those who will cause corruption, spread corruption and, and bloodshed and so on and so forth, meaning, you know, they're not saying this out of i'tirad, they're not saying this out of rejection or out of objection even to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But just to understand, oh Allah, you know, we've seen what happens when, when, when a creation is given hurriyat al ikhtiyar, when they're given free will and choice, what they do on this earth. Are you going to put another creation that's going to do the same thing? And on top of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says khalifa. Now khalifa uh, by its nature, it means uh, a caretaker, it means a successor, it means someone who has free choice to do uh, what they want to with that which they've been placed in charge of. So the Khalifa you know, succeeds, he takes control and he's to continue the work if you will. As Ibn Abbas anhu says, we are khulafa to one another on this earth. Uh, we succeed one another on this earth in taking care of this earth with the responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to us. Which is why Allah calls the people of Ad khala'if. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Maryam, فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُ الصَّلَاةِ That after the Prophets there came خَلْفٌ that lost the prayer, uh, that, that you know started to become neglectful and careless. And خَلْفٌ, خَلْف uh, is the opposite of Khalifa according to some of the scholars. Khalifa is someone who continues the work. Khalfun is someone who comes and does the opposite. Okay, which the people that, the generations that came after the Prophets, they did the opposite of what the Prophets were sent to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes further, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْتَعْمَرَكُمْ فِيهَا That He established you in this earth. He established you within it. And istimar means you are here to build. Allah established you in it and you are here to construct and to build and to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you and to fulfill the trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you over this earth. So the jinn will continue to exist here, the animals will continue to exist, the insects will continue to exist, but you, O children of Adam, will be placed in charge. And this is before Adam alayhi salam was even created to show you that Adam alayhi salam from the very beginning was meant to come to this earth. He was meant to be in charge of this world. So when the angels say, Ya Allah, are you going to put onto this earth, you know, people that are going to have the choice and they're going to, you know, spread corruption once again and they're going to spread bloodshed. And they said, Wa nahnu nusabbihu bihamdika wa nuqaddisu lak. Ya Allah, we worship you. We glorify you. You know, and, and you know, we, we don't fall short in that or we would hope that we don't fall short in that. And the angels here, they weren't praising themselves. You know, you might hear this and you might think to yourself that, the angels have a sense of pride, they have a sense of kibir. That they're saying to Allah, Oh Allah, why don't you put us in charge? The angels are free from those diseases that we have as human beings and jinn. So they're not saying this as a form of pride. In fact, they're declaring Allah's perfection and purity. Nuqaddisulak, that they're declaring His purity in saying that, Oh Allah, you know, we're not questioning what you're saying. And in fact, some of the scholars, the way that they interpreted this, and this is very beautiful, that they're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are we not doing a good enough job in our tasbih, in our glorifying you? 
that you'll bring that you have to bring about another creation to do so oh allah are we not meaning they're worried oh allah are we not worshiping you enough because we said that's the characteristics of the angels it's from their characteristics that they would say to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ma abadnaka haqqa ibadatik that we did not worship you as much as you deserve to be worshiped so there's a sense of concern on their part that are we not doing a good enough job now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to them and says inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun I know that which you don't know. Allah could have given them the reasoning. Allah could have given them the wisdom. Allah certainly knows it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't create without purpose. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead tells the angels, because this is the way that the angels have been raised, that I know that which you don't know. And it's very beautiful that the scholars say that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I know that which you don't know, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant by that is that from this creation, you will have the Anbiya, the Prophets. You will have Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You will have the Shuhada, the martyrs. You will have as Siddiqun, people of truth. You will have people of righteousness that the jinn could not produce at that level. There is no equivalent from the jinn of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in fact from any creation. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels, I know that which you don't know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to them that yes, despite the fact that these people will come and they will spread corruption and they will murder and so on and so forth. There will be elements of khayr in this creation, elements of goodness in this creation that would surpass even the angels, that would surpass even the malaika. I remember one of the first lectures I listened to uh, was from Dr. Jeffrey Lang. Um, and he was saying that, you know, I, I used to ask this question as well. Why did God create us? Why did God put us here? Why did God allow this to happen? And then I read in the Qur'an that Allah says, I know that which you don't know. <laughs> and it answers the question. It satisfies everything. You know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically tells you, look, I know what I'm doing. If you've come to the conclusion that Allah is alim, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-knowing and the all-wise, then you submit, your, you submit yourself intellectually as well to say, oh Allah, I know that there are certain things that you know that I don't know and I'm satisfied with that. And that's part of our creation, that's part of our submission, and that's part of our servitude and ibadah in the first place to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this gives us some more context as to what's brewing inside Iblis now. Iblis was raised by the angels, he's been given the shape of the angels, he worships amongst the angels. And now he's hearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the angels that there's a creation that is superior to the jinn that is going to come and that they are going to be given control of the earth and that there, are going to, that there are going to be people amongst them that will be greater than the jinn and this ate away at Iblis because the thought process of Iblis at this point is why didn't Allah just leave me there? So there's a jealousy, a, an envy that's already brewing inside of Iblis before Adam salam is even created. The Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُ يَوْمٍ طَلَعَتْ عَلَيْهِ الشَّمْسُ يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ That the best day that the sun has risen upon is the day of Friday. فِيهِ خُلِقَ آدَمْ That is the day that Adam ﷺ was created. وَفِيهِ أُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ And that is the day that Adam ﷺ was entered into paradise. وَفِيهِ أُخْرِجَ مِنْهَا And that is the day that Adam ﷺ was expelled from paradise. And so what we take from that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam ﷺ on the day of Friday. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in fact, the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah created Adam ﷺ as the last creation on the last hour of the hours of Friday. So Adam salam was created at the end of the day of Friday. And that's very powerful because, you know, what that means is that that, is, that coincides with what's known as Sa'at al-Ijaba, the hour in which your dua is accepted. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that there's an hour on the day of Friday that no believer calls upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with something except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers it. And in one narration, the Prophet specified that it is the last hour of the day of Friday, being the, the same time that Adam alayhi salam was created. So that's the time to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything. So Adam alayhi salam being the last of creation, one thing we can take from this though, is that both Adam alayhi salam and Hawa and his wife are without mother and without father. And the scholars say that that shows that the orphan has worth, that you know the orphan can never be put in a situation 
where he's told that he's worthless or that he's nothing. In fact, we of course are, are part of the Ummah of Rasulullah who is known as the orphan that adopted the world. Right? So SubhanAllah, it's something very powerful that no person can connect their lineage to Adam salam. There isn't a single person in the world that can connect all the way back to Adam salam. Which means that in some way, shape or form, we're all orphans. Right? Adam salam has no mother or father and we also cannot connect to Adam salam. And in that of course is, is a very consistent message from the Messenger وسلم, which is not to boast about your lineage. Okay, and this was something that was prevalent amongst the Arabs in particular. And Allah subhanahu and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, O people, قَدْ أَذْهَبَ اللَّهُ عَنْكُمْ عُبِيَةَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ وَفَخْرَهَا بِالْآبَاءِ Or تَعَاظُمِهَا The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in, in two narrations, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done away with your slogans of the days of ignorance and you're boasting about your lineage, you're boasting about your fathers, you're boasting about where you come from, you're boasting about your tribe, you're boasting about your race. The Prophet ﷺ says, مُؤْمِنٌ تَقِيٌّ وَفَاجِرٌ شَقِيٌّ وَالنَّاسُ بَنُوا آدَمْ وَآدَمْ مِنْ تراب. He said وسلم, that now there is a believer that is righteous and there is a wicked man that is, that is miserable. Okay, these are the only two categories of people we have. And all people are the, are, are the children of Adam. All people are the children of Adam. And Adam was from Turab. Adam was from dirt. Now the Prophet ﷺ, he uh, goes through a very detailed description of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam. He says sallallahu alayhi wasallam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel. And in some narrations it specifies Jibreel alayhi salam. And, it t- and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a handful of each part of the earth, all of the different surfaces, all of the different types of the earth. So he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَجَاءَ بَنُوا آدَمْ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ الْأَرْضِ that, that the children of Adam came in accordance with the different colors of the earth. فَجَاءَ مِنْهُمُ الْأَحْمَرُ وَالْأَبْيَضُ وَالْأَسْوَدُ وَبَيْنَ ذَلِكَ So you have some amongst them that are, that are white, that are, that are black, white, red, brown, and everything in between, so all the different colors. Because Adam السلام, was created with a combination of all of the different color, uh, all of the different colors, and he said, "Sallallahu was sahlu wal haznu wal khabithu wa tayyib, the the easy going and 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 the al haznu, the grieving, the sad, the thick, if you will, wal khabith, which is uh, filthy, wa tayyib, which is pure, right? And and you know, I know uh, Ustad Nurman uh, tried to fit nationalities into this, right? So he, you know, in, in, in his uh, class on Adam Islam on Fallen, I know, I, I heard him actually say that As-Sahlu are the Malaysians, which makes sense because mashallah the Malaysians are, are beautiful people and they're always easy going and chill and relaxed. Well, Haznu, he said the Pakistanis, I can't say that. That's between him and the Pakistanis, right? Al-Khabithu, he left it blank and I think he said Al-Tayyibu was the Bengalis. Allahu Alam, you could fit in all your races in there. Just leave Al-Khabith, all right? So you can praise the others if you will. Just leave the khabith part. But the point is, is that we're combined with all of these different types of dirt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it into Adam alayhi salam. Hence his lineage comes in accordance with the different colors of the earth. And we are all equal in that sense. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he created Adam alayhi salam first from turab, from dirt. Which is obviously something to humble us, that we all come from dirt in that regard. Because our father comes from dirt. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a turab and he made it into tleen. And tleen is al turab ma'al ma. It's dirt mixed with water. So it becomes mud. So first it starts off as dirt. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mixed it uh, with, with water and it became uh, mud. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it tleen in lazib. And tleen in lazib is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered it to, to let it dry and to, and t- till it became sticky. Lazib means it becomes sticky. And then after it became dry and it became sticky, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it into hama in masnoon. And hama in masnoon is dark, smooth mud, which, in, which indicates to us obviously that Adam alayhi had a darker complexion. Okay, in fact, linguistically speaking, Adam, when the, when the Arabs would describe someone as, as Adam, they would, they would mean that he had a dark complexion. Okay, and then after hama in masnoon, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left it as dark smooth mud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it into salsal, which is molded clay. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he says that in each stage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left it for 40 days or for 40 years. The Prophet sallallahu simply says, قَدْ تَرَكَهُ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَتْرُكَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left it as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, willed. But at the end of the day, 
uh, each one of these stages went into the creation, the molding of Adam alayhi salam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ He praises the creation, the way that he created Adam alayhi salam. What went into the, the making of Adam alayhi salam and the making of the children of Adam alayhi salam. But at the end of the day, it starts from dirt. And subhanAllah, it's very powerful when you think about that, that as human beings, even though our creation is different from Adam alayhi salam, Allah says that we, you know, our father came from Turab, but we start off as Nutfa, we start off as the drop of fluid. Even so, when we are buried, when we are placed into the dirt, our body is consumed by the dirt once again. SubhanAllah, think about that. Our bodies are once again consumed into the dirt. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also created Adam alayhi salam as very tall, okay? And when I say tall, I don't mean tall like, like me, all right? I'm, I, I hear all the, the silly descriptions, all right? Whoever made the bio, which I'm still pretty bitter about, the friendly giant, okay? I'm not a giant. There are many people that are tall, and they're pretty big by our standards. But what was Adam alayhi salam like? The Prophet sallallahu says that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala khalaqa Adam, Allah created Adam, wa tuluhu situna dira'a. And Adam alayhi salam was 60 cubits, which is about two football fields. <laughs> So Adam alayhi salam was huge. Now, it's not just Adam alayhi salam. The Prophet sallallahu said that everyone enters into Jannah with the surah of Adam alayhi salam, with the way that Adam alayhi salam is, with Adam alayhi salam's stature. Okay? So Adam alayhi salam was huge, and when we enter into Jannah, we would also be very big, we would also be huge. And his body now was left, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala molded it to this, per, to, to this beautiful perfection, his body was left hollow. It was just, you know, at that point, it was just sitting there without soul. And Iblis started to go by that body and he started to enter into it and he started to leave on it and he started to knock on it and it would make like a vibrating sound as he knocked on it. Okay? And he's saying to himself, لِأَمْرٍ مَا خُلِقْتُ What were you created for? Right? What were you created for? Iblis still doesn't get it. He's bitter because he hasn't seen Adam Islam speak yet and so on and so forth and he's already been given all of this privilege. And when Iblis entered into Adam Islam's body and, and, and came out and knocked and so on and so forth, Iblis said, هَذَا خَلْقٌ لَا يتمالك, That this is a creation that is not going to have any power. It's not fit for power. It's not fit to be in charge. And he declares his enmity to Adam Islam before the soul is even given to Adam Islam. And he says, لَإِنْ صُلِّطْوَ عَلَيْكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّكَ If I'm put in charge of you, then I'm going to lead you astray. وَلَإِنْ صُلِّطَ عَلَيَّ And if you're put in charge of me, لَأَعْصِيَنَّكَ Then I will disobey you, I'm not going to listen to you. And so, so it shows you the early enmity between Iblis and Adam salam, and that's something that's true also for every child of Adam. Okay, the Prophet ﷺ said that the, that the shaitan touches every child of Adam salam on the day when his mother gives birth to him. Okay, so as you are born, boy or girl, Shaitan touches you, he pokes you, and he declares his enmity uh, with you without even knowing anything about you. And the only ones that were spared from this, the Prophet ﷺ said, were Maryam salam and her son Isa salam. Why? Because the mother of Maryam said, Wa inni u'idhuha bika wa dhurriyataha mina shaitan rajim. She sincerely sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Maryam and her offspring, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them from that. Otherwise, Shaitan declares that enmity from the very start. And so that's something that's very powerful that our body at that point, you know, we, we, are, we really don't have much. And subhanAllah, we find that our worth comes after that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي خَالِقٌ بَشَرٌ مِنْ طِينٌ That I'm creating بَشَرًا مِنْ طِينٌ I'm creating a, a, a human being that's made of dirt. فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ Once I complete him, once I proportion him, and I breathe into him of my spirit, فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Then you should fall uh, in prostration to him. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مِنْ رُوحِ from my spirit, this is a means of venerating the soul. It's not literal. It's not that we, we, we have the spirit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside of us. It's the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the Kaaba Bayti. 
okay, or, or you know, my house, or the or, or naqatullah, the she camel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah al-Shams. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala venerates it uh, by saying, when I breathed into it, min ruhi, right, my spirit. But it's not obviously, again, the spirit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we don't have any divine uh, nature inside of us. But the point here, and what's to be taken from this, which is very powerful, is that the body was worthless without the soul. Okay, the angels were not commanded to prostrate, to make sajda, until the soul was breathed in. Which shows us that you know our internal being, our character, our morals, our akhlaq, our internal beauty, is far more important than our external beauty. And we should be far more concerned with altering that which is on the inside, and making that more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making that more beautiful than our outside because that's where our true value and our true worth is. It's even the case with our father Adam alayhi salam that the angels were not taught to show any means of veneration to the body of Adam alayhi salam until the soul was placed in. And that's why the Prophet says, لَيَدِعْنَا رِجَالٌ فَخْرَهُمْ بِأَقْوَامٍ That we should leave our boasting about our tribes and our boasting about where we come from. Let the people cease to boast about their ancestors. And he said وسلم, something very powerful. He said, you know, those people are merely fahmi jahannam. They're merely the fuel of hellfire. And they are worth less to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the beetle which, rule, which rolls manure with its nose. SubhanAllah, you know, saying that when you're just a body but you have a corrupt soul on the inside, your body at the end of the day doesn't mean anything here, nor will it mean anything in the grave because it's going to decompose nor will it mean anything when you are raised on the Day of Judgment because it will merely be the fuel of hellfire. So it's important for us to better our internal being because that is what makes us beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what makes us beloved to the angels. That is what makes us honored even to other people. You know, even the angel doesn't come to you when you're in your mother's womb in fact until after four months when it brings the soul. And so subhanAllah, even if you were chemically to be able to remake the body and to, and, and, to, and to recreate and clone, what are you going to do about the soul? You can't do anything about the soul. This is what makes us special as human beings. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the soul into Adam alayhi body, something very beautiful happened. As the soul was breathed into the body of Adam alayhi salam, he sneezed, atasa. And when he sneezed, he said, Alhamdulillah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, when Adam ﷺ said, Alhamdulillah, so the first words spoken by man were, all praises be to Allah, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded and said, Yarhamuka Rabbuk, may your Lord have mercy on you. And so subhanAllah, you can imagine how powerful that is, that the first exchange between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and mankind is, Alhamdulillah, Yarhamuka Allah. That you know, you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah says, may Allah have mercy on you, may your Lord have mercy on you. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in fact, that whenever you sneeze and you don't say Alhamdulillah, shaitan mocks you. Or when you sneeze and say Alhamdulillah and someone else doesn't say Yarhamukallah, may your Lord have mercy, mercy on you, shaitan mocks that person because shaitan saw that initial conversation and shaitan knows the implications of that conversation. And then as the soul continued to go into his body, Adam alayhi salam's eyes open and Adam alayhi salam sees Jannah. Now when Adam alayhi salam sees Jannah and he sees the palaces and he sees the trees and he sees the fruits and he sees all of this beauty around him, Adam alayhi salam actually tried to jump for those things before the soul reached his legs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a comment and he said, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we were created in haste. And that's in Surah Al-Anbiya that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes us as a hasty creation. But that hastiness did not stop Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from blessing us with His mercy. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that despite our imperfections and despite our being forgetful creatures, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still shows mercy to us. So I want you to imagine the sight. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Adam salam his soul, all of the angels fell in sajda to him. They all fell in prostration. All, I mean subhanAllah, trillions and trillions and trillions of angels. Imagine the sight, all in prostration to Adam salam. This is what he wakes up to, subhanAllah. Now the sajda, the sujood, the prostration, uh, you know, just to, just to clarify here, it's not worship. They were not praying to Adam salam, And this was something that was done 
out of respect and out of uh, you know out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in fact commanding them to do so and this is something that was actually done in previous nations we see it in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam where his parents and his brothers make sujood to him they prostrate to him and in fact even in the time of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam uh, when Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu came back from Asham, when he came back from Syria, and he saw the way that the Christians did sajda at that time, they prostrated to their monks, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he did sujood to him. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he corrected him, and he said that this is something that was allowed in nations before, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done away with it. Meaning, even the sajda that is done out of taqdeer and ihtiram, that is done out of respect and, and honoring a person, that was prohibited and the only thing left now was the sajda of ibadah, the prostration of worship because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this ummah clarifies tawheed, clarifies monotheism once and for all, okay? So all of these angels fall into sajda to Adam alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, illa Iblis. Iblis just stood there. And Iblis, you know, is, is the only one there who's actually not an angel in the first place, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him gave him that company, gave him even the shape of an angel. And Iblis just stood there as the angels made sajda. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Aba wa stakbar. That, you know, he, he felt a sense of pride. He felt a sense of, of denial, of, of envy inside of him. And he even responded, Ana khayrun min. That I'm better than him. Khalaqtani min nar wa khalaqtahum min teen. That you created me from, from fire and you created him from dirt. Why should I make sujood to him? Why should I prostrate to this lowly creature? And Imam bin Sirin rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that Iblis was the first one to ever use qiyas, qiyas facet, you know, false analogy, right? To make an analogy, to say, well, I'm clearly better than him because I've been made of fire and he's been made of dirt. And that makes Iblis also the world's first racist, right? SubhanAllah, because he thinks he's better because of his creation. He thinks he's superior. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, puts him down as a result of that. Now, uh, this sujood to Adam alayhi salam from the angels also shows that you are going to be in khidmah, you will be in service to this creation. And we've already mentioned that the angels are in service to us, obviously at the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iblis, you know, just couldn't handle this. And subhanAllah, you know, Iblis belittled him so much that he didn't even mention his name. Uh, Iblis says, أَرَأَيْتَكَ هَذَا الَّذِي كَرَّمْتَ عَلَيَّ You see this one that you've preferred to me. You know, I remember uh, in the presidential debates between John McCain and, and Barack Obama, where McCain said this one about Obama, and I'm not comparing McCain to Iblis or Obama to Adam alayhi salam, but this one, you know, was very degrading, right? That's exactly what Iblis did to Adam alayhi salam. He said, you've preferred and honored this one, this creation. I'm not even going to say his name. I'm not even going to mention him in an honored way over me. And this is the ingratitude of Iblis, the ingratitude of shaitan. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him the wasf, the sign or, or the characteristic, the attribute of ingratitude? Because Allah has taken you from the earth. Allah has put you in paradise. Allah has given you the shape of an angel. Allah saved you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have left you with those other jinn that were battled. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognized your ibadah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved you and he elevated you. And he's given you Jannah, you're in paradise, what more do you want? But still, Iblis was ungrateful, subhanAllah. And that ingratitude led him to his ultimate doom, subhanAllah. As a result of his ingratitude, did he gain anything? Did he gain the power of the earth again? Did he gain what he wanted? No, actually, he lost Jannah. He was reduced back to an ugly shape. So he, didn't re he, he was not able to keep the shape that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to him of a malak. And he was expelled and cursed and, and just despised as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described him. Ukhruj minha fa innaka rajim. Get out of here and you are a despised and despicable creation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And subhanAllah, we see from that as well that ingratitude is what causes a person not to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the weapon of shaitan. He comes to you and what does he say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That I will make them ungrateful. Because if they're ungrateful, they won't be driven to worship you anymore. Just like I'm not driven to worship as a result of my ingratitude. SubhanAllah, he knows his own shortcoming and that's the shortcoming he hopes to project on others. And the Prophet Wasallam, and this is very powerful, you know, he tells us that Iblis does have regrets here. He does have regrets, but it's not enough to regret. And if I was to ask the average Muslim, do you think that shaitan ever feels bad about what he's done? I mean, the pride and the audacity that he had. Most Muslims would say no. 
But the Prophet ﷺ says in the authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, that when any person makes sujood, when the son of Adam prostrates, اعتزل الشيطان يبكي, the shaytan actually takes to the side and he starts to cry. Shaytan starts to cry. يقول, أمر بالسجود فسجد فله الجنة. He was commanded to make sujood, he was commanded to prostrate, and he prostrated. And so Allah will give him paradise. وَأُمِرْتُ فَعَصَيْتْ فَلِيَ النَّارِ And I was commanded, and I disobeyed, and for me is the fire. And what this shows us, subhanAllah, is that, you know, crying is not enough. You know, when, when you do something bad, there's a saying from one of the famous ulama, that لَيْسَ الْخَائِفُ مَنْ يَبْكِي وَيَمْسَهُ عَيْنَيْ It's not true fear just to cry and to wipe your eyes when you've done something wrong. وَلَكِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتْرُكُ مَا يَخَافُ أَنْ يُحَاسِبَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ But he's the one who leaves that which caused him to fear Allah in the first place. Because shaytan, and it, you know, as much as he cries, as much as he feels bad about it, he never turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He continues to turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a recipe for disaster. And in fact, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah says in this very collection of Al-Bidayah wa Nihayah, he says that shaytan cried four times. There are four times that shaytan cried. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared him to be cursed. The second time, when Allah expelled him from paradise. The third time, when the Prophet sallallahu was born. And the fourth time, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Fatiha. And so we end with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the gift of Surah Al-Fatiha as was taught to us by the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in hopes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter us into Jannah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make us from the blessed and those who are eternally rewarded. So now we go back to Adam alayhi salam. And Adam alayhi salam, as we said, all of these angels are in front of him. They've made sajda to him. And Adam alayhi salam is just waking up to this, to, to this magnificent creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after showing Adam alayhi salam, you know, the angels making sajda to him, as well as Iblis refusing to make sajda, and Adam knowing that this creature hates him uh, for nothing that he's done on his own, Adam alayhi salam is then told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go to those angels, and there was a gathering of them that were sitting as the Prophet sallallahu said, and say to them, assalamu alaykum. So Adam alayhi salam is taught to say salam to them. So he goes to this group of angels as they're sitting and uh, they're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he says to the angels, assalamu alaykum. And they respond and they say, wa alayka salam wa rahmatullah. And may the peace and of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you as well. And they added the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you, if you realize this is a consistent theme with the conversations that Adam alayhi salam is having uh, in paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first thing he told Adam alayhi salam was, Yarhamuka Rabbuk, may your Lord have mercy on you. And the angels increased upon the salam by saying, Wa rahmatullah, and may the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you as well. And this is something that, that uh, when we enter paradise by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels are constantly coming to the children of Adam alayhi salam and saying, Salamun alaykum bima sabartum, peace be unto you for the patience that you that you carried yourselves with in this world because they, they saw the sacrifices that we've been through at this point. Uh, when, when they constantly, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَدْخُلُونَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ بَابِ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ طِبَتُمْ And another uh, ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they say, سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ طِبَتُمْ You've been purified. So they're entering upon you, مِنْ كُلِّ بَابِ Every gate in paradise, you just have angels coming upon you saying, سَلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ سَلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ سَلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ سَلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ So this is the first conversation now between Adam and the angels. And that's a proof that the angels actually love us. They don't feel any form of jealousy from us. And in the previous uh, conversation they had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they questioned, you know, whether whether uh, the son of Adam or, or whether the children of Adam would be able to maintain the earth properly, they didn't do that out of any form of jealousy or any form of envy. Rather, they loved this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Assalamu alaikum wa alaykas salam wa rahmatullah. May the peace of Allah be upon you as well as his mercy. Adam alayhi salam comes back to his Lord and the Prophet sallallahu says that Allah tells Adam alayhi salam inna hadhihi tahiyyatuka wa tahiyyatu banika baynahum that this is going to be your greeting and the greeting of your children amongst each other. 
Now the thing is, Adam alayhi salam still has no idea who his children are. He hasn't even been told yet that he's going to have an offspring, that he's going to have children. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Adam alayhi salam that this is going to be your greeting and the greeting that you would have between one another, uh, Adam alayhi salam doesn't know what, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about in regards to his children. So the Prophet sallallahu says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then extracted the children of Adam alayhi salam from his back. And Allah presented to Adam alayhi salam all of his children from the first of them to the last of them. Meaning as Ibn Abbas anhu said, the last person that the hour would be, would be established upon. Can you imagine subhanAllah, Adam is seeing how many, you know, how many billions and billions of years of human beings is Adam alayhi salam seeing in front of him? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam says that when Adam alayhi salam sees this, all of these souls, Adam alayhi salam says, Ay Rabbi, ma ha'ula? Oh my Lord, what are all of these? Not who are all of these, not man ha'ula, what are these? <laughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ha'ula'i dhurriyatuk, that these are your children, these are your offspring. فَإِذَا كُلُّ insan, The Prophet ﷺ says, so at that point, each and every single human being is standing before, before Adam alayhi salam, مَكْتُوبٌ عُمْرُهُ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ And his age, or the years that he will live, are written, is written between his two eyes. And Adam alayhi salam, as he sees all of these children, and some of them have 60 between their eyes, some of them have, you know, some of them are in the hundreds, some of them are, uh, are, are 20. Adam alayhi salam uh, at that point sees that one particular person lights up, is illuminating. As the Prophet says, فَإِذَا فِيهِمْ رَجُلٌ مِنْ أَضْوَائِهِمْ That there was a man amongst them who was from the most illuminated of them. So Adam alayhi salam says, Ya Rabbi man hadha? As he sees this light shining, he says, Oh my Lord, who is this? The Prophet ﷺ says that Allah said to Adam alayhi salam, هَذَا بْنُكَ Dawood. This is your son Dawood alayhi salam. كَتَبْتُ لَهُ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً And I've written for him 40 years. Adam alayhi salam seeing how beautiful Dawood alayhi salam is and the nur that he has, the light that he has, he says, Ya Rabbi zidtu, Oh Allah, add to his age. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَاكَ الَّذِي كَتَبْتُ لَهُ Look, that's what I've written for him. So Adam alayhi salam says, Ay Rabbi, inni qad ja'altu lahu min umri sitina sana. Look, O oh Allah, O oh my Lord, I've given him 60 of my years. You can take from my lifespan and give to Dawood alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, anta wa dhak. Then if that's the case, then so it will be. Now this story has a continuation which we'll get to inshallah ta'ala later on when Adam alayhi salam is reminded of that. But Adam gifted Dawood alayhi salam 60 of his years. Now the question is why Dawood alayhi salam? Why would Adam alayhi salam particularly choose to give that to Dawood alayhi salam? Because the mission of Adam alayhi salam was isti'mar. As we said, it was to build. And Dawood alayhi salam would build on this earth better than anyone else. So Adam alayhi salam wanted him to have a longer life where he could establish himself more and establish the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a greater fashion. Also, Dawood alayhi salam is a prophet that's recognized for his worship even by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And nur here is what's particular being, particularly being mentioned, light. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that on the day of judgment, light, we would have light from uh, the effects of our wudu. Think about Dawood alayhi salam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that there is no qiyam there is no standing up at night that is greater than the qiyam of Dawood alayhi salam. He used to stand up for the last third of the night in prayer. And the Prophet sallallahu also used to stand up for the last third of the night in prayer. And there is no fasting better than the fasting of Dawood alayhi salam. Dawood alayhi salam used to fast alternate days. So he'd fast one day and break his fast the next day. Fast one day and break his fast the next day. And he continued this tradition. So Dawood alayhi salam is a prophet that combines you know, great ibadah, great individual worship, as well as establishing the da'wah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. Now, what about the Prophet sallallahu Did Adam alayhi salam see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and did he recognize the greatness of the Prophet sallallahu being from his children? Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says that the Sahaba actually asked the Prophet sallallahu Ya Rasulullah, mata wajabat lakan nubu'ah? O Messenger of God, when was prophethood written for you? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi says, wa adamu when Adam alayhi salam was still between the phase of being body and soul. So that, that particular process of the soul being uh, breathed into Adam alayhi salam, between that happening, between Adam's creation and between the spirit 
uh, coming into Adam alayhi salam's body, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote down prophethood for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So before Adam even breathes, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi sallam has prophethood established for him. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi sallam also says, بُعِثْتُ مِنْ خَيْرِ قُرُونِ بَنِي آدَمَ قَرْنًا فَقَرْنًا That I have been sent as an apostle, as a messenger, in the best of all of the generations of, of Adam's offspring, since their creation, حتى كنت من القرن الذي كنت فيه, until Allah subhanahu wa taala placed me in this generation that I am in. Meaning, the Sahaba as well. When Adam alayhi salam was looking at all of his offspring, he didn't just see the Prophet alayhi salam. He sees this generation of the Sahaba, right? The best generation that's ever walked the face of the earth. That includes people like Abu Bakr and Umar and Aisha and Khadija and these people, and they are just lit up. And this is something that that's very powerful to take that the Prophet ﷺ was not just the greatest Prophet, but he was placed within the greatest generation of the children of Adam ﷺ. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the greatest of Adam ﷺ's children and to join us with the Prophet ﷺ and the great Prophets of God and the Siddiqun and the Shuhada, uh, the, the truthful ones, the martyrs, the companions, and all of those that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah to grant us that far-reaching light on the Day of Judgment. So then a question arises, are the children of Adam السلام, were their souls eternal, were they there before Adam السلام, what were they doing before these bodies came and so on and so forth. And the first answer to that question is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who's eternal. So the souls are created, okay, however the souls were created before the bodies. Just as with Adam السلام, we find that Adam السلام's body was created and his soul was placed in. But uh, Adam alayhi salam's soul was already created, as the, the scholars of tafsir say. Imam al-Suyuti rahimahullah says it was a thousand years before Adam alayhi salam that all the souls were created. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how long before. All we know is that Adam alayhi salam's body was made and then his soul was placed in. And as for us, our souls already existed before we came to exist in this world. However, the souls were then placed into the bodies as they reached, uh, as they reached the age of four months within the wombs of our mothers. So then Allah subhanahu Ascends the soul which is placed in at that point. Now, in this situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wiped the back of Adam السلام, and we all came out. And we see the conversation that took place between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Adam. السلام, but did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak to us at that point? And this is where we find the uh, ayah in Surah Al A'raf where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Then mention when your Lord took from the children of Adam السلام, from their loins, their descendants, and made them testify of themselves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us all out, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to each and every single one of us, Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا And they said, yes, we bear witness, we have testified. The angels then said, أَن تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ The angels who are witnessing this taking place say, lest you should say on the day of resurrection, indeed we were of this unaware. So what's happening here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making us, before we even come into this world, before we even have bodies for the souls to occupy, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is already making us testify to His oneness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting within us this fitra, this natural inclination towards that testimony to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the interesting thing is that the angels say, أَن تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ you know, lest you should say on the day of judgment that you were unaware of this. But what if we're already unaware of this? So here's the thing now. This incident took place, as the Prophet ﷺ said, on the day of Arafah. Okay, and actually in, in the narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, it says, Bi Nu'man, right, which is the valley behind Arafah. Nu'man is the valley behind Arafah. So it took place on the day of Arafah. And the significance of that is that Arafah means to come to know. Arafah means to come to knowledge, to come to know. And as we said, the Sa'at al Ijaba, the hour which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers our du'as every week, is the last hour on the day of Friday, which is when Adam alayhi salam was created. So that's the best hour of the week. But what's the best day of the year? It's Arafah. 
right, by absolute consensus, is Arafah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by Arafah. And it is the day that we come back to recognize our origin and we come back to bear witness to that covenant once again, which is why the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Arafah is un unlike any other day of the year because we've returned back to our origins and we're not denying that covenant we took with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, who testified here? Was it just the believers? Was it just the prophets? Actually, each and every single person testified on that day to Allah's oneness, right? So that means the worst human being that you could think of. That means Fir'aun on that day stood and said, Bala, right? We bear witness that you are our Lord, Shahidna, right? Uh, the tyrants of the world today, all of them bore witness to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every single human being. Now a question arises, if we're going to be told on the day of judgment, and in fact, if the angels told us, you know, don't come on the day of judgment and say that you don't remember this. And if we don't remember this even today, are we held to that covenant? And this is a very significant question because if you say that we're held to that covenant that we took with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that means if a person walked the face of the earth and they were simply never exposed to the risala, to the message of a messenger that was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they're going to be punished because they should have remembered that promise and that covenant that they already took. However, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amazing. And Imam ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that my Lord decided in his infinite mercy that he would not punish those who went back on this covenant unless the hujjah, unless the proof was established against them in this world through messengers and messages that they rejected. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رسولا. We don't punish a people until we send to them a messenger. So no, we're not held to that covenant unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends to us the messengers or the messages in their pure form or the messengers of those messengers that bring to us that pure form, that pure message and we're able to, uh, to understand it and then we choose to reject. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would punish us. Then what's the point of this covenant in the first place? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never took away the effect of that covenant. As the Prophet sallallahu said, each and every single child is born with fitrah. We're born with that natural inclination to worship one God. Monotheism is the asl, it is the origin of, of us as human beings. If you left people out in the middle of nowhere, they would naturally connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There would be some form of recognition of a divine presence. It's already placed inside of us. That's the effect of that covenant. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring up on the day of judgment as the Prophet says, يُقَالُ لِلْرَجُلِ مِنْ أَهْلِ النَّارِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ That the, the person who is destined for hellfire would be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment and Allah would say to him, أَرَأَيْتَ لَوْ كَانَ لَكَ مَا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ أَكُنْتَ مُفْتَدِيًا بِهِ you know, if, if I was to give you everything that existed on the face of the earth, would it benefit you in any way today? Would you, you know, if, if you could present for yourself uh, the earth full of gold twice to get yourself out of this situation, would you do so? So the man would say, Naam, of course, I'll do anything to get out of this situation. قَالَ فَيَقُولْ But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say to him, قَدْ أَرَدْتُ مِنْكَ أَهْوَنَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ قَدْ أَخَذْتُ عَلَيْكَ فِي ظَهْرِ آدَمَ أَنْ لَا تُشْرِكَ بِي شَيْئًا فَأَبَيْتَ إِلَّا أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِي شَيْئًا He would say, all I asked you was for something so much less than that. Allah would say, I didn't ask you to present the earth full of gold. All I asked from you was to recognize the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was to not associate partners with me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I took that covenant from you when you were still coming out of the back of Adam alayhi salam, that you would not associate a partner with me, but instead you insisted that you would associate in some way, shape or form a partner with me. You insisted on doing so. So the effect of the fitrah is there. Allah leaves it inside of us. And then once the message is presented to us, we then become accountable to that covenant covenant we took with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day that he spoke to us which is known as Yawm al mithaq the day of the covenant. So what is this realm that Yawm al-Mithaq took place in, that the Day of the Covenant took place in? It's a realm that's known as Alam al-Dharr, which is the, the realm 
of, uh, of, of a dhar. A dhar is where we were first created, where we were first brought to life. And that alam, that realm, is part of a greater realm, which is known as alam al-arwah, the realm of the souls, where the souls gather. So alam al-dhar is more specific than alam al-arwah, the, the place where we took that covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that realm that we existed in as we took that covenant, is a part of Alam al-Arwah, the realm of the souls. Just like after we pass away from this world, there's Alam al-Barzakh. Uh, al-Barzakh, uh, which is the transition realm, is also part of Alam al-Arwah, the realm of the souls. So what is this Alam al-Arwah? And it's a really strange realm. The realm of the souls is a really strange realm. Uh, it has never ceased to exist. We still interact with it even in this dunya at times when we're in our sleep. Uh, partially, but not fully. As the scholars describe when we pass away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu yatawaffal anfus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the, uh, he takes the souls at the time of death. But also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that whenever we go to sleep, right, yatawaffakum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes your souls. So your souls partially exit your body and they exit into this realm or they enter into this realm of the souls. And when you're in this realm of the souls, you interact with things that, that you're not accustomed to interacting. So is it possible, for example, that you end up meeting uh, another person in that realm? Absolutely. And Imam al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he affirmed this, that there are times that the soul would exit the body at the time of sleep, partially, and it would interact with another soul that's in alam al-arwah. That's not to say that every time someone sees uh, someone from uh, someone that they, that's passed away in their dreams, that it's a true dream, but certainly it can be. It's like when you see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grant us that, that ability to see him Alayhi Salatu Wasallam in our dreams and in the day of, on the Day of Judgment and in Jannat Al-Firdaus. Uh, you know, you get a chance to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Your soul interacted with a soul in that realm, which is so strange that we really cannot, we, we cannot define the parameters of that realm, we are completely clueless when it comes to that realm. Um, in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, They ask you about the soul in general. And it's so complex that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul min amri rabbi. Just say that the soul is from the affairs of your Lord. There is no way to even really fully put parameters or define what the soul is, what a ruh is. Okay? So the question becomes, what were our souls doing from the time that we took that covenant until the time that we came into this world. Were they interacting with one another? Because they do interact with one another, as is established through many authentic narrations, in Al-Barzakh, in the realm after this world. What about before this world? The Prophet ﷺ says, Al-Arwahu Junudun Mujannada. That the souls are like recruited soldiers. Ma ta'arafa minha talaf, wa ma tanakara minha khtalaf. That those souls that used to get along before they came into this world, they naturally find themselves inclining towards one another in this dunya as well. And those souls that didn't get along in, in the previous realm, they also find a natural aversion to one another. And there's a beautiful story behind this that uh, many people don't know. Aisha radiallahu anha, who narrates this hadith, she says that there is a woman in Mecca that used to make all of the women laugh. She was known for being a jokester. Uh, the women of Mecca would go to her for some, you know, uh, for some comic relief, right? She would sit with all of the women in Mecca and she would make them laugh. And she became Muslim. Now Aisha radiallahu anha doesn't say her name. She could be one of the famous Sahabiyat, but she became Muslim. So this female companion of the Prophet Sallallahu was well known for joking all the time and making all of the women laugh. So naturally she was a very pleasant woman. Then she made hijrah with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they migrated from Mecca to Medina. And as you know, when they got to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ paired off the Muhajirun from Mecca, uh, the people that migrated from Mecca, with the Ansar, with the helpers in Medina. So they ended up in the houses of various Ansar, in these different houses. So she ended up in the house of the woman in Medina, who used to make all the women in Medina laugh. <laughs> so the Prophet ﷺ, you know, when he saw this, that this woman that was famous for making everyone laugh in Mecca, just happened to end up in the house of the woman who was famous for making all the other women laugh in Medina. And they became great friends and they were great sahabiyat, they were great companions. The Prophet ﷺ, he commented by saying, al arwahu junudun mujannada. He said, these souls, they knew each other in the past. So those souls that used to incline towards one another, they incline towards one another in this dunya as well. And those souls that felt an aversion to one another, they still feel, feel an aversion to one another as well. And that's why sometimes, subhanAllah, you meet someone for the first time and you're like, you know, I feel like I've met you before. And, and you're, you naturally have an affinity towards that person. 
You know, especially whenever it's in the capacity of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You meet someone in Hajj, or you meet someone in Umrah, or you meet someone in the Masjid, and you just naturally feel like you've known each other your entire lives. You probably did. You probably used to sit with one another in that previous realm, and you probably liked one another in that previous realm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Maryam, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ سَيَجْعَلُوا لَهُمُ الرَّحْمَانُ وِدَّةِ That indeed those who have believed and done righteous deeds, the most merciful will appoint for them affection. He will send them special friends. SubhanAllah. So the believing souls will naturally be directed towards one another by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you do have divinely appointed friends and those people that you love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in particular, you probably loved each other in a previous realm as well. And Allahu alam how it used to be. Allahu alam, you know, uh, what the, what it even meant to be friends in that realm and what it would mean in the next realm. But we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we find ourselves in that alam, in that world of souls, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala includes us amongst the believing souls that are rejoicing and that are from the righteous and those that, that rejoice in the... Com- in the companionship of the, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then says, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala taught Adam Alayhi Salaam the names of all things. And that particular topic of what Adam alayhi salam was taught is quite fascinating actually. The scholars say Adam alayhi salam was taught al-musammayat. And al-musammayat, what that means are things that were concepts and they were mere, merely conceptual. Adam alayhi salam was able to take those things and was able to give them you know, an operational measurement. He was able to actually define them. He was able to actually identify the details within them. So all of these things and people are presented to him alayhi salam, and Adam alayhi salam knows how to define them. Now, what this is referring to, you know, uh, it's, what it's really referring to is a precise eye. You know, my dad is a chemist and he's a distinguished professor in chemistry. And so when he looks at something, and he sees, uh, you know, and he sees the name of it. He's able to go through all of the properties of it because he's a chemist. So he naturally sees more within the chemicals, right? Within the ingredients, right? If you're an engineer, then you see more in construction. You don't just see the the highway. You see more within that construction. Uh, if you're a farmer, then you know you don't just see a particular fruit at one stage, but you're able to see all of the, you know, all of the different stages of it. And you'll even give it more names. I always test my hedge group when we go to date farms. And I say, you know, what type of date is that? What type of date is that? And, you know, you've got people there that, that might even be illiterate, but they can give you 20 different names for dates at their different stages. So Adam alayhi salam is given all of that. All right. He's able to look at things and he's able to identify things and he's able to give the measurement. And essentially Allah gave Adam alayhi salam an incredible amount of knowledge. And if you, you look at it just scientifically, right, different parts of the mind excel in different people. And you know, different parts of the mind usually uh, would work towards certain types of sciences and so on and so forth. Adam alayhi salam is being given this knowledge by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after he taught Adam alayhi salam these names, ala He presented them, he showed these same things to the angels. فَقَالَ أَنْبِئُونِي بِأَسْمَاءِ هَؤُلَاءِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels, inform me of the names of these, if you are indeed truthful. Now, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about here, if you are indeed truthful? When the angels objected uh, in, in the beginning, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً That I'm going to uh, place a successor on earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to their objection and he's saying if you are truthful in that I don't create anyone more knowledgeable or capable than you that can be a khalif on earth. Okay, so if you are truthful in that claim or in that objection, then you go ahead and name these things that Adam alayhi salam was able to name. Now the angels didn't argue, they did not fight. And again, the nature of their objection in the first place was not one of questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, it was trying to understand the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placing human beings on this earth after what had happened with the jinn. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that to them, they said, Subhanaka, la ilma lana illa ma allamtana, innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. They said, exalted are you. You know, they glorified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How perfect are you? We have no knowledge except what you have taught us, and indeed it is you who is the knowing and the wise. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned to Adam alayhi salam, he said, teach, you know, teach them those names. So Adam alayhi salam started to go through all of the names of these things that the angels were not able to identify. And he started to present to them, you know, according to some of the Sahaba, the names of the human beings as well. All of these human beings, Adam alayhi salam was able to present their names. And according to some of the Sahaba, Adam alayhi salam was even able to start presenting to the angels their names. So he turns to them and he starts to say to them what their names are. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ لَكُمْ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ غَيْبَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَأَعْلَمُ مَا تُبْدُونَ وَمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْتُمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels, Did I not tell you that I know the unseen aspects of the heavens and the earth and that I know what you reveal and what you have concealed? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the angels once again, look, there is a purpose here. However, what the ulama say here, which is very powerful, is that this particular last line of the ayah, I know what you reveal and what you conceal, that this was a message not just to the angels, but also to the shaytan who concealed his hatred and his jealousy and his pride, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knew what was inside. And Allah knew the innocence of the angels as well as uh, the, the, uh, the nature of shaytan, right? The evil nature of the devil and what he planned to do with Adam alayhi salam. Now, the greatest message that we can take from all of this, obviously, is that فَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, above everyone who has knowledge is one who possesses more knowledge, right? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has more knowledge than the angels, and Allah has chosen to conceal some of that knowledge even from the angels. But here in this particular context, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preferred Adam alayhi salam with his knowledge to the ibadah, to the worship of the angels. And this teaches us a very important lesson in our religion, that knowledge is superior to worship. So in this particular context, Adam alayhi salam was made superior to the angels and the children of Adam alayhi salam were made superior to the angels only in that particular issue, in that particular area. And of course, as we said before, you know, uh, when, when, when human beings choose to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and choose to um, you know, to do away with those desires that take them away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then their rank also supersedes the angels. And Allah was teaching the angels a lesson as well as Adam alayhi salam because Adam is listening to the angels responding to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying, Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana. That there is, you know, there is no knowledge except what you've taught us. So Adam understands that just like the angels were taught particular parts of knowledge, Adam alayhi salam was, was taught particular portions of knowledge. And Adam alayhi salam also is seeing the humility in the response of the angels, which is why the scholars say, la adri or la a'lam, to say I don't know when you really don't know is half of ilm, is half of knowledge. To be able to recognize that I don't know is half of knowledge. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the, the ability to recognize that which we need to recognize, uh, to grant us the blessing of knowledge that is beneficial, to allow us to worship Him in a way that's pleasing to Him, and to allow us to do away with those desires that would make us animalistic, or even worse, that would make us satanic. So what is the benefit of learning that Allah's preference that He's assigned to Adam Islam and his children is a result of the knowledge that He's given to them and that knowledge is greater than ibadah, uh, is greater than worship and so on and so forth. It teaches us that Allah created us with a purpose. That purpose is knowledge and acting upon that knowledge. And there's a very interesting uh, note here. Allah says in the Quran, Ar-Rahman, He introduces Himself subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, Ar-Rahman. Then Allah says, عَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنِ He taught the Qur'an. Then Allah says, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانِ He created man. Then Allah says, عَلَّمَهُ الْبَيَانِ He taught him expression. If you notice here, Allah mentions first, the first favor upon us, the first favor of the Most Merciful is that He taught the Qur'an even before our creation. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala, he also points out here, he says, notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say, خَلَقَ الْقُرْآنِ That He created the Qur'an. 
But instead, علم القرآن, he taught the Quran, which is a very significant point in our creed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has spoken the Quran. The Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's not a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we take a few lessons from this order here. Number one, that the Quran is more important and more noble than the creation of man. SubhanAllah, it's that high, it's that elevated, it is that honored and that noble that it's even mentioned before the creation of man. As if to say there would be no purpose for the creation of man had it not been for that guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create man without guidance, right? That you were not created without purpose. You were created for something very clear. And that's why even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He mentions us, when we come out of our mother's wombs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ السَّبِيلَ يَسَّرَ That Allah guided him to the path. And that has a double meaning, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him out of his mother's womb. So he, he made your pregnancy easy. And the second thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided you to the spiritual path, to the path that you should be on, the path of knowledge and the path of worship and so on and so forth. And in that is actually a response to uh, to, to agnostic uh, agnostics or, or skeptic theists or whoever they may be, those that would claim that there may be a God that or that there surely is a God, but that God created us without purpose and that we don't know what God wants of us and that God has not sent messengers or messages and so on and so forth. Uh, what would be the point of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of a God creating all of this without guidance? So Imam Suyuti rahimullah, he actually comments on uh, the order in Surah Al-Rahman. He says, هَذَا تَرْتِيبٌ رُتَبِ وَلَيْسَ تَرْتِيبًا زَمَنِيًّا That this is, uh, that this order that Allah is mentioning here is one of benefit, is one of priorities. It's not one that is chronological. Because could we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught the Qur'an before He created man? No, who did Allah teach the Qur'an to, right? Before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Imam Suyuti is saying Allah is pointing out something very important here. Ayla ma'na li wujud al insani min duni manhajin yasiru alayhi. That there is no point for the existence of man without a methodology that he should that he could proceed upon to gain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the Quran is a greater gift than creating you because had Allah created you without knowledge, without purpose, and knowledge of that purpose, then it would have been absolutely miserable. And that's why you find people become miserable in life when they don't know why they're here. You know, you ask someone the, the basic question, why are you here? What's your purpose? What's your calling? And when you can't answer that, then you're absolutely miserable. Because you want to know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you here in the first place. So Allah taught you the Quran. And before creating you, he had a purpose for you and he had guidance for you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you within the framework of that guidance and of that purpose. Then Allah Azza wa mentions that he taught you how to express yourself. And expression is one of the greatest gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why we find that, you know, one of the most frustrating things and one of the mo most uh, difficult trials that a person could go through in life is that they're unable to express themselves. Even medically speaking, you know, if, if a person is in, in a coma and they're responsive uh, or they, they know what's going on around them, but they're unable to express themselves. Or if they have a permanent condition where they're unable to speak properly or express themselves. It's a great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives to a person when He allows you to clearly know how to express yourself. But notice, by the way, that Allah mentioned expression after knowledge, which goes to the previous point that you should not express yourself without knowledge. Don't speak without knowledge. First comes ilm, then comes bayan. First comes knowledge, then comes speech. Now, the most beautiful thing that we can take from all of this, and this is the greatest lesson that I would take from this personally and that I hope that all of you would take, is that, you know, Allah truly has assigned our nobility as His creation to the amount of knowledge that we gain and we act upon. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَ The best of you, the most noble of you, as human beings are those that learn the Qur'an and then teach it. The Prophet ﷺ also says, أدناكم, that the preference of the scholar to the worshipper is like my preference, my status over the lowest of my ummah. So Allah has preferred the people of knowledge who act upon that knowledge, that don't just learn, but actually embody that knowledge to people who merely worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's where their nobility is, and particularly their knowledge of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an. And you can't learn the Qur'an without knowing the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and living like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, trying your best to, to emulate that 
And that's who you are as a person. That's where you measure yourself, uh, you know, on the scale of purpose. Am I living up to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to be? Am I fulfilling the purpose for my very existence and for my very creation? And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those that are proceeding upon that proper methodology to gain His pleasure and live up to their purpose.